But now let's talk about what's in the cell. Okay. Um, and again, the best way that I like to put it is think of it as uh, a village, and you have this moat that goes around the village. You have a castle there that controls everything inside the village. That's your nucleus. We're going to have roads all going through there. There's something called the NFI particulum. There's certain ones that are going to give pow the powerhouses of the cell. There's electric companies that's going to be the mitochondria. Think of it like that, okay? I have to go along here. So this is, again, another picture of a cell, and we're going to talk about these parts now. Now, inside the cell, we have the big thing that's going to be there is going to be the nucleus. And like I said, that's the one that's going to control everything that the cell does, kind of like Washington, D.C. for the United States, okay? But... Think of also what's around the cell. So between the nucleus and the cell membrane is going to be a lot of fluid and a lot of other what we're going to call organelles, these other things, ribosomes and, and other structures that we're going to talk about. It's basically everything from the castle in the village and everything outside until you get to the moat. That's what we call cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is all the material that's between plasma membrane and the nucleus, okay? The cytosol is the <coughs> fluid that's there, but not the solid structures that we're gonna talk about. But there's other things in there too. There's amino acids floating in that water, there's electrolytes floating in that water, okay? And that's what we call cytosol. We also have these organelles, these solid pieces of structures that we're going to see. It's the machinery of the cell to make sure it does its things. The road work, the little houses inside the village, the, uh, the blacksmith and the carpenter area that's going to make things in there, all right? Some of these structures will have the same membrane that you just saw on the plasma membrane, okay? Some of them will have two membranes around themselves, giving them an extra protection. The nucleus is a good example of that, all right? Like Washington, D.C., you have to have a gate and then another gate right in front of it. You need extra protection there. And then there's some that don't even have uh, membranes on it. They're actually made up of two particles, two subunits. Uh, a, a ribosome is a good example of that, okay? Then we have this cytoskeleton, okay? Let me just, uh, cytoskeleton is just what it sounds like. It's the skeleton of the cell, okay? And the functions of this is that it's gonna determine the shape of the cell, the structural support, organized contents that we're gonna talk about in there, all right? And it's going to direct movement of substances and contribute to cell movement, should the cell be moving. Some cells might turn into amoebas, not turn them into amoebas, but have an amoeba-like movements. And this is what's going to help it do that. And what the, cytos the cytoskeleton is, is a series of rods that are all through the cell itself. You have three different types of these rods. We have microfilaments. Good example of this is actin. And you'll get to know these later on as we go about talking about this throughout the next few weeks. These will have will make up something called microvilli, which will increase surface area. They'll also form cilia and flagella, like the little tail that you see on the end of a sperm. It'll help with muscle contractility so that muscles can contract and also will maintain cell shape. We have intermediate filaments, which is gonna strengthen the nuclear membrane, also known as the nuclear envelope, and will also maintain the cell shape. There will also be microtubules that organize the organelles and will move the cilia and flagellum. These, the microfilaments, will make the flagellum and the cilia. This will move it. And it'll also take part in cell division, a process that we're going to learn about later today of mitosis. 
And it kind of looks like this. You have all these rods that are going inside the cell, and that's what's going on here. Okay? So it kind of makes the shape of the cell. Now, we also have things called centrioles and spindle fibers. Okay? These are located in something we call the centrosome. And I'm going to show you a picture of this so it'll make sense to you. There's specialized, it's a specialized area that's on one part on the outside of the nucleus, but it's just lying on the outside of that nucleus. And it's made up of two what we call centrioles. The functions is that it's going to form the basis of the cilia and the flagellum, and before the cell is ready to divide, these things are going to move on opposite ends of the nucleus, create what we call spindle fibers, and it's going to help move the chromosomes that we're going to talk about to two different cells eventually. The centrioles are kind of put on in a 90 degree angle on each other. This is a centrosome made up of two centrioles that are crisscrossed with each other. I'm not going to go into detail of how these are actually made. That to me is biochemistry later on. You'll learn about that if you want to. Okay? Cilia. We have non-motile cilia and we have motile cilia. Cilia is when you look at the top of the cell, this is a cell, we could have little hairs that go up like this. Not really hairs, they're cilia. And they move, or they may not move. In the ear, and in the nasal cavity, there's fluid in this area over here. And when the, when the fluid moves in a certain direction, this cilia is going to bend in that direction. And this could be hooked up to a nerve. If the cilia move in that direction, it's going to send electrical impulses to the nerve, and that goes to a part of your brain that says, oh, you're moving in a certain direction, because the cilia moved in that direction. This is where we'll see it in the ear, where it deals with balance. An example of this is if you keep your eyes closed and you're in the passenger's side on, on, in a car, you could tell if the driver is moving left or right, even without your eyes open. Okay? It's the way that the water is moving in your ears and moving the cilia. So in this case, the cilia don't move on their own. That's why I'm saying it's not motile. It doesn't move on its own. But we do have cilia that does move on its own. And we have a good example of this is in the trachea, the windpipe. When you breathe in stuff in a lot of particles, if you're in a saw, saw mill or something like that, or you're breathing in a lot of bacteria, it starts building up in here. And you start producing a lot more mucus. When that happens, the cilia kind of push the mucus up to your mouth, create the cough reflex, and you cough it out. We also see cilia in the fallopian tubes. And the fallopian tubes have the cilia inside there because it kind of pushes the egg towards the uterus. Well, towards the, hopefully the sperm is there if you want to get pregnant. It says, oh, right, come on, he's a good guy. Yeah, go over there, it's okay. You know? All right, so that's where you'll see it on there. All right, and it's kind of looking like this, but it does this kind of sweep kind of thing if they move whiplash kind of thing. So it could be mucus up here and this cilia can push the mucus. The mucus is going to collect those dust particles, the bacteria, and when it gets pretty heavy up there, then the cilia can kind of try and push it that way so it doesn't go down further into where your um, <coughs> air sacs are, where there's going to be um, uh, gas exchange. So what happens here, um, let's talk about like in, in the throat area or where, the, uh, where the trachea is. You have the saline layer at the apex, meaning like at this area here, you're going to have saline, an aqueous, a water solution up here. There's mucus in there, but let me explain to you what's happening here. 
chloride pumps, and just bear with me, I'm going to show you what, this is normal, what's happening here, and I'm going to talk about a disease that you've all probably heard about, but I'm going to put it together here. Chloride pumps are located at the apex area here, in other words, at the top area of these cells. Chloride is going to be pumped out there through ATP. It's going to go out there. Now, that's going to make outside the cell more negative. Chloride is a negative charge. Okay? That's not a natural thing, or that's not a homeostatic thing. So what's going to happen is, as chloride is going out there, sodium is going to go out there too. So the chloride pump is pumping the chloride out there, making it more negative on the outside. That's saying, whoa, something's not right here because it's getting more negative. So I'm going to, the brain says, I'm going to put more positive out there and that'll counteract the charge. Does that make sense? It becomes back to what it was, neutral. Except there's a problem with that. When you're putting negative out there and more positive out there, you're putting it more concentrated out there, are you not? You're making it more concentrated. So as sodium's going out there, water is going to follow to try and dilute those ions outside. You catching on with me? Okay, negative out there, not good. Put positive out there, it neutralizes it. But there's too much ions out there, we have to dilute that. So we're gonna put water out there, okay? It's a domino effect. Cilia can beat freely in the aqueous watery solution because water is now out there, the cilia can now move and push things along. There's some mucus in there, but the mucus collected the, the, um, uh, the particles, but the cilia can't, it's like quicksand, it's like really thick, it can't really move in there to push it upwards. So at this point, we're gonna put more watery out there so it can push it upwards. It's all collected, now put it out there. That's the way it normally works, and thank God you don't even have to think about it, you just take it for granted, that's what happens in your body. Well, is everybody on the same page as me? Now let's talk about cystic fibrosis. Okay? Cystic fibrosis, there's a defect for the chloride pumps. They're there, they're just not working properly. So now you're not going to put chloride out there. The mucus is still out there, but the chloride can't go out there. If the chloride is not going to go out there, there's no way sodium wants to go out there. And if there's no sodium going out there, there's no water that wants to go out there. So what's left out there is mucus, a thick mucus. And the cilia can't move that thick mucus. So now you've got bacteria and you've got dust particles that are going to stay in that area. Well, that mucus is a great reservoir, a great area for bacteria to grow in. Oh, they love that. Bring a kid to a candy store. That's what's happening over here. Okay? So now they're going to start getting a lot of infections. Okay? So cystic fibrosis is a hereditary disease in which the cells make chloride pumps, but they don't really do their job. They're not working. So the chloride pumps can't make the saline solution that's out there, and the cilia can't move. So therefore, they're going to have, not just in the lungs here, in the trachea, they're going to have it where all these chloride pumps are supposed to be working, in the pancreas and other places, and now they're going to be really thickened with this mucus, and it's not going to work well. Usually people with cystic fibrosis, they have diabetes because things are just not working well in the pancreas. They get thick mucus, they can't even digest things properly. So you get this inadequate digestion of nutrients and absorption of oxygen because it's all happening here. They usually die because of chronic respiratory infections because they can't cough this out properly. They do get respiratory therapy where they kind of teach the parents how to uh, basically break up the mucus in their trachea by not pounding, but shaking and breaking it up on the back and then teaching the child to cough that out. Well, it may be easy for an eight-year-old to know how to cough, but not, let's say, a one-year-old. You see what I'm saying? Okay? So, 
one in 20 Caucasians carry this gene. So this is something that's pretty prevalent. And we'll talk about, you know, what's the chance of you getting this if you carry the gene. Problem is with this, life expectancy is usually 30 years old, and they usually die of respiratory infections. Okay? Questions about cystic fibrosis? Okay? Again, I'm not trying to make this into a medical school kind of thing. I'm trying to put diseases in here to emphasize, to give the normal stuff meaning. Instead of just memorizing what the chloride pumps do, you're going to forget about that two years or three years from now. But you'll remember cystic fibrosis having something to do with the chloride pumps. It gives the normal stuff meaning. It gives it some example on that. Okay. Flagellum. There's only one cell that has a flagellum in the human body, and you ladies don't have it. Okay? The sperm is the only thing. Okay? And that's going to make the sperm swim to you, love, to, the, to the lovely egg inside you. Okay? All right. Now, let's talk about the organelles. The nucleus. Now, what I'm going to do here is very briefly go over the next couple slides, what each one does. Very briefly. And then I have one slide for each one. And I'll spend more time talking about it. So the nucleus, more than one nucleus, we say that there's two nuclei, and some cells do have more than one nucleus, all right? Skeletal muscles have a lot of nuclei in there because it needs to make a lot of protein, so it needs a lot of people helping out as much as possible. So the nucleus here is going to control all the activities in the cell, and it's going to contain what we call deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short. This is the map of you, and we'll talk about that later on. It's very protective of it. It never leaves the nucleus. We're going to have a double lock on it so that things can't get in there to destroy the DNA. We also have inside the nucleus something called a nucleolus. And we could have more than one nucleolus there. We say that there's two or three nucleoli. Okay? So, again, keep an eye on the spelling because that would make a big difference for these four things. The nucleolus found in the nucleus is going to make what we call RNA, ribonucleic acid, and it's used to make proteins from the DNA, and we're going to talk about that later on. Ribosomes are outside in the cytoplasm, so it's outside the nucleus. These are more like your, um, your stores or your, uh, the places that are going to make things the blacksmith that's in the village, the carpenter that's in the village and stuff, they're going to make things. The ribosomes here are going to make proteins. And proteins do a lot of different things. When you get into the, uh, the chemistry lecture, you'll see a lot of different things that it does. Okay? So it's a site where protein synthesis happens. Some of these ribosomes, and they're very small, they're little balls, um, they may be just free-floating in the cytoplasm, or they may be right on a road. And that road is called the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is going to go from the nucleus and its roadways throughout the whole cytoplasm. Okay? And it's going to transport materials from one part of the cell to another. Golgi apparatus, also known as the Golgi complex. This is going to, after the protein is made, then the Golgi apparatus is going to package it and put it into a form that makes some sense. Okay? It's basically taken, if you were going to take all my PowerPoints and put them onto paper, Xerox them, now you're going to take them to Staples, and Staples is going to put holes in them and put spiral bound around there and put a cover and a back bar. It's going to package it. The protein's already made. Your copies are already made. They're just going to make it better to handle, suitable for whatever you're going to use it for. Lysosomes are in your cells, and they are containing a lot of digestive enzymes so that when a bacteria, if it comes inside, like phagocytosis, it brings a bacteria in there, and we've got to destroy it. The lysosome is going to fuse with that bacteria and the lysosome will open up and let all its digestive enzymes go right into the bacteria and destroy it. So this is the police of the village that we're talking about here. And at times, when the cell is ready to get too old and want to die, then the lysosome will release all its enzymes and do like a suicide, a kamikaze type thing, and will just 
make that cell self-destruct. Okay? I guess that's probably where they get, yeah, someone else asked me that too, like, yeah, uh, that's probably what's, what I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, um, sometimes those, the medications and stuff, it kind of makes sense, like Robitussin, Tussive means to cough, so Robitussin, I guess they, they kind of said Robitussin is a cough medicine, because Tussive, T-U-S-S-I-V-E, means to cough, so a lot of these companies like to add those kind of things in there, and yeah, I would think Lysol does that. Mitochondria is the electrical company that's in the village. It's the one that's going to make the ATP. It's taking in the oxygen and the glucose from parts of your body, bringing it in here, and it's going to make ATP. Okay, so those are the organelles. A few other ones, but those are the major ones, and then we'll get into the other ones now. Okay, so now let's talk about a little bit more detail about each one of these things. The nucleus, what's in purple over here, pinkish, okay, it's going to contain the blueprints of you, i.e. DNA, okay? It's going to contain two phospholipid bilayers, not just one, there'll be actually two in there. Since we have two, we refer to it as a nuclear envelope. Since it has such vital information that's in there, we need to make sure nothing really gets in there. We're going to put a double door on there, so to say. We also have, well, the DNA is chromatin. Okay? Um, I'll explain. It, chromatin and chromosomes, they're the same thing. Okay? Uh, best way I can explain this, I might as well just do it now. Let's say we have 46 volumes of a reference encyclopedia set in the library, okay? Um, and they're all bound together, okay? Uh, they're easier to manage when they're bound together. I could put three or four of them in my, in my arm over here, it's no problem. If we want to divide them, it's easier to do it that way. So that's what we call chromosomes. The information is DNA. The information in the encyclopedia set that's written on all the pages, that's the DNA but they're bound in books. That's chromosomes. And the only time it's bound in books in a cell is when it's time to divide. Otherwise, the way it is, is that they take out each page out of the book and they lay them down on the floor. Every page. This way, when I need to make a copy or want to read about something about Victorian roofs, I don't know then I can look, I can scan the whole thing and say, oh, there it is. I don't have to flip through all the pages. When it's laid out like this, very thin, light can come through it if it wanted to, that's called chromatin. When it's loosely coiled like that. Okay? When it's tightly bound in books, it's called chromosome. It doesn't matter. DNA in the books or DNA written over here, either way, it's still DNA. It's just how it's structured. Okay? So that's why I put chromatin chromosomes. Most of the time it's chromatin. The only time it's chromosomes is when we're ready to divide something called mitosis. We also have the nucleolus in here, and that's the site of making ribosomes. And like I said, the nucleus is going to dictate everything that cell is going to do. Question. Uh, there's something called chromatid. Isn't that just an arm of the chromosome? Mm -hmm. Yep, and I'm going to show you that. Yep, a chromat you know, it's part of a chromosome. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we actually uh, get into what DNA looks like, genetic material looks like. Okay? Some cells don't have a nucleus. A red blood cell doesn't have a nucleus. It did early on, but when it became a mature red blood cell, it's not. The reason why it isn't, is it doesn't have a nucleus, is because you'll learn, but inside a red blood cell, it's loaded with oxygen, and oxygen has to be bound to a protein called hemoglobin. If you put a big, good old nucleus in there, it's occupying too much of the red blood cell. So if we knock off the nucleus, we could pack it a lot more with hemoglobin. So that's why a red blood cell has no or has, I'm sorry, has no uh, nucleus, okay? Some cells have more than one nucleus, and I mentioned the skeletal muscle. There's also something called an osteoclast. 
it's because it's got to do a lot of different jobs, more than the usual, so it needs extra help. It's like two countries working together, two uh, Washington, D.C., so to say, working together. Okay? The ribosomes. The ribosomes are what's going to make proteins. It's made up of not um, a phospholipid bilayer, or any phospholipid for that matter, no membrane, but it's actually made up of two particles, two subunits, something we call a 60S, which is pretty big, and a 40S, which is pretty small. They kind of go on, they kind of come together like a clam would, okay? Some of them are free, they're just floating all in the cytoplasm. Some of them are attached to endoplasmic reticulum. These are the things that are like your Staples company, they're, they're, they're the stores. Some of them are freestanding, some of them are part of, uh, that are actually on the road. Some of them could be on Route 10, some of them could be just, you know, out there, you have to drive out there, it's not on the main roads or anything. And they will contain proteins and a certain kind of RNA called rRNA. We'll talk about the different types later. Um, we also have other RNAs. Uh, mRNA is going to read coded genetic messages. And when we get into it after the break, we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, our ribosomes are going to assemble. AA is... Um, amino acids and they're going to make uh, take amino acids and put them all together and you're going to have proteins so that's what ribosomes are going to do they're going to take the amino acids and make proteins out of them the endoplasmic reticulum is this interconnected roadways that's happening throughout the whole cell some of them will have these red dots on them those are called uh, well those are the ribosomes all right, and somehow they all connect to the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum. It's like any road in the United States, somehow it's all connected to Washington, D.C. Even Alaska, I wouldn't say Hawaii, but even Alaska is somehow connected by roads that are going to lead to Washington, D.C., right? All right, so it's, that's the same way. All the roads, all the endoplasmic reticulum, <coughs> somehow, God bless you, is connected to the endoplasmic reticulum. I'm sorry, to the nucleus. If the endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on it, we say it's rough endoplasmic reticulum, or rough ER, okay? This is going to contain the ribosomes, and this is specifically going to make phospholipids and proteins. But some endoplasmic reticulum don't have ribosomes, so they won't have any connection with proteins. In fact, they're going to uh, be associated with making lipids. And that's called smooth ER. It's not rough. There's no ribosomes on it. It's smooth. And that's where it's going to be uh, making lipids or, or fats. The Golgi apparatus, also known as the Golgi complex, they kind of look like stacked envelopes. And the protein is already made. But now it needs to be packaged. Like I said, you make Xerox copies of all my PowerPoints. But now you're going to take them to Staples, and you have to package it so it's easier to manage with. Put holes in them and put spiral bounds around them, okay? And when it does this, it can do the fate of that protein could do a few different things, okay? It starts off over here, goes to this envelope, that envelope, that envelope. It modifies that protein to what it needs to do until it pinches off the last one, and now it's in what we call a vesicle. That protein is inside this vesicle. And the vesicle can do one, it could be about three different things it could do. It could either just be a secretory vesicle that could be stored throughout the cell and used for a later use, or it can actually become part of the plasma membrane, or it can also become a lysosome itself. So it's kind of showing you here the the Golgi apparatus, here's one pathway that can come out later on. It can go like this, can become part of the membrane itself, or it can become a lysosome that will go in with and do whatever the lysosome needs to do. Lysosomes. Again, these are going to have digestive enzymes, 
and is going to release them should a bacteria come inside the cell and kill them. If the cell is getting too old, it'll do like a quote unquote cell suicide or autolysis. And it's going to release its digestive enzymes and just break down its own cell. Tay Sachs disease. Who here has heard of Tay Sachs? This is a hip class. Good. Tay Sachs is a genetic disease, and what it is is that it's deficient. The people who have this, they don't have a certain lysosomal enzyme called hexoamidase. This is very common in the acidic Jew population. And what happens here is, and we'll get into this, when we get, we'll talk about this again when we get into the nervous system, but just briefly because we're talking about lysosomes. What's happening here is that normally we have glycolipids that are in the brain and they need to be broken down. This enzyme would break it down, but if you don't have this enzyme, then these glycolipids are going to accumulate. And when they get so much, they're going to press down on the nerves, and the nerves won't function. There's too much of it in there. So it's going to interfere with nerve conduction, and, can't, and that person can't do certain things. It'll lead to blindness, loss of coordination, and eventually dementia. And unfortunately, they usually die by five years old. Okay? So I put that, we'll talk more about it when we get to the nervous system. Okay? Peroxisomes, similar to lysosomes, they have enzymes, but there's only one type of enzyme that's in there. It's called catalase. Catalase is an enzyme that's used to break down hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a byproduct metabolism, but it's lethal to the cell. So we have to get rid of that hydrogen peroxide. And what it does, it breaks the hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, into water and oxygen, which then we can use that stuff. Does that mean that lysosomes are part of the It's not produced, it packages it. The protein, which is the enzyme, is made by the ribosome. Okay. But then it gets handed off to the Golgi apparatus to package it, form it into a a certain structure that we can actually use. Okay. okay. Mitochondria. It's the powerhouse of the cells. The thing that's going to make ATP. Okay. And this one also has two membranes on it. There's an outer membrane, and then we have this undulated membrane that happens in here. This undulation is called criste. This is going to produce the ATP that we need. Because it's, ATP is so vital for us to survive with, we are not, the mitochondria is not going to wait for permission for the nucleus to tell it to make ATP. This needs to make constant ATP all the time. It doesn't need to wait for the nucleus to do that. So because of that, the mitochondria has its own DNA. If it needs to make ATP, if it needs it, to make it, there's a lot of enzymes in here. So if we need to make more enzymes to make ATP, it's not going to ask for the nucleus' approval for that. It has its own right to do that. There's certain things, hey, state laws, they don't have to get a, approval from uh, the president to do certain things. Does that make sense? Okay, same thing here. So they have their own DNA. We call it mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA. Okay? They don't they can actually replicate themselves. They don't even need the approval from the nucleus to do that either. If you need more ATP, the mitochondria says, you know, we need to make more ATP. I'm not gonna wait for nucleus to, to tell us about that. I'm just gonna get an approval. I'm gonna make two more uh, mitochondria so we can get the extra help. Okay? It's that vital in our body to do that. All the energy in our body is derived from ATP. And like I said, you need glucose and oxygen to make that. If you don't have glucose, you don't have oxygen, you're not going to make ATP. Okay? Question? Um, what is it? A bacteria? Yeah,
I don't know. I never heard of it that way. It's an interesting hypothesis, but I never heard of uh, mitochondria being a bacteria. Oh, with the evolutionary theory? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly what yeah. Which I guess it could make somewhat sense if it has its own DNA. All right? So we just, I guess, through evolution. If that's true, I don't know about that, but if it is true, then it's something we've actually piggybacked off of and we just utilized it for better ourselves. Okay? Um, so we have this mitochondrial DNA, okay? When a sperm enters the egg, the sperm's mitochondria gets destroyed. So the mitochondria from the sperm never get into the, D into the egg. Does that make sense? But the egg has its own mitochondria. So it has its own DNA from the egg, okay? Therefore, only maternal mitochondrial DNA can get passed onto the next generation. The males doesn't. Does that make sense? Okay? Now, there are mutations that happen. Mitochondrial DNA mutates more often than DNA, regular DNA that's in your nucleus. They produce or can produce rare hereditary diseases. One so is this myopathy, a certain muscle disease, mitochondrial myopathy. And if dad has mitochondrial myopathy, he can't pass it to his child. Does that make sense? Mom has it, she can pass it. Okay? So mom can pass on DNA that's mitochondrial. Dad cannot. Put in it. Mom, you gave me something dad never could. <laughs> I gave this to my mother. She said, I don't understand it. She doesn't understand the far side jokes either. So. Um, but you see, you guys understand it now, okay? Um, so that's what that is. So there's our cell, okay? And in the other school, we have a model of the cell on this board. So that's what that is. So at least you want to see what that looks like. All right, so let's talk about genetic material. All right, now we're getting nitty gritty. Right? We talked about the chromosomes versus chromatin the chroma, uh, and the chromatids and so forth. Chromosomes, okay? This is the map of view. We have 46 chromosomes in every non-sex cell. Non-sex cells are also referred to as somatic cells. You've got 23 chromosomes that you got from mom and 23 chromosomes you got from dad, making 46. The gametes are the sex cells. The sperm is a gamete, the egg is the gamete. But there's only 23 chromosomes in one sperm, and there's only 23 chromosomes in one egg. But when they unite, you've got the 46. When it unites, it's known as a zygote, at least for the first four days. Okay? A gamete contains half the number of chromosomes that you would find in a non-sex cell. If it's a full set, as in a non-sex cell, they would have 46 chromosomes, and we refer to that as a diploid. But if they have half the number of chromosomes, as in an egg or a sperm, we refer to it as a haploid, and they only have 23 chromosomes. All right? A gamete is an egg, it's a sperm. Okay? Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA holds together each chromosome. Everybody in this room, everybody on this earth has the same DNA. Huh? Yeah, they do. You have to have the same DNA. If you got a different DNA, then you're a pig, or you're a bat, or a plant, right? You all have the same DNA. So then what makes everybody different? Okay. What's happening here is this. You all have the same textbook. You all have the same chromosomes. You, everybody in here has the chromosome for blue eye color, red eye color, blue eye color, brown eye color, green eye color. You all have the chromosomes for that. It's like you have your own textbook. Everybody has the same information in all your textbooks. But at the end of the semester, I look at every book, it's going to look different. 
Why? Because certain people are highlighting this word, some people are highlighting this word, some people are highlighting this word. So what's happening with DNA is that some people have their blue eye color highlighted. Some people have the brown eye color highlighted. You see what I'm saying? Everybody has the same DNA. It's just that certain ones have certain highlights on them. That's what makes us different from each other. We call these blue eye color, red eye color, that kind of stuff, those are genes, okay? Yes, when we compare ourselves with the closest thing to a human, the chimpanzee is the closest. How much closer? Well, we're only 2% different in DNA with a chimpanzee. 2%. And yet, look at the difference between us. Okay? The next one, I believe, is an orangutan. And believe it or not, the next one after that is a pig. Okay? What I'm saying is 2% is a whole lot of, you know, of a window, a big window when you deal with this. So we are 98% chimp. <laughs> okay? All right. So a gene is a trait, as I just explained to you. A certain segment of DNA that makes a protein for a certain eye color, hair eye color, that kind of, or hair, hair color, eye color, okay? So it determines that thing. It also makes it, um, you may have a gene, I'm using just those things that you can see, but it also, you might have the gene for, let's say, diabetes. You might have the gene for Alzheimer's disease, that kind of thing also. So it also tells you if you're susceptible of getting certain diseases. When you put all of it together, the whole, all the gene, the genes where they are, it's the map, we call it the genome. The genome is this whole map. And it took about 10 or 15 years, probably even longer than that, to, to map out where everything is. In other words, you have 46 volumes of chromosomes up there, encyclopedia said. The genome, it took 15 years or so to figure out blue eye color is on page 64 in volume 23. So they mapped out, they know where everything is at this point. All right, and it took a long time to do that. All right, 2% of DNA is genes. 98% really is not going to code for anything, okay? It just plays in roles of chromosome structure, some junk DNA that has no function at all. So 98%, well, let's put it this way. If you get an encyclopedia set and you weigh it, it's pretty darn heavy. But when you really think about it, the weight is the paper, is the binding, the string in the binding, the ink, but not the actual word, the theory. Do you see what I'm saying? When you actually weigh the theory, the thoughts, it's going to be so small. Everything else, it has to be put on paper so you can read it, though. Does that make sense? So that's why it's so small on there. 98%, it's really just structure-wise. Or we still haven't figured out what it does. It really doesn't do anything at all. Okay? This is what it looks like. It's got, well, it looks like that. Okay. I try to come up with some theme, usually, for the ties. But what it is is that it's a, it's a ladder that's twisted on itself. Okay? We call it a double helix, a spiral ladder. Okay? Heredity, a trait or a gene that's passed down from one person to another. Okay? A gene or chromosome could be mutated. In the process of this is happening, whether someone uh, gets an infection, certain uh, viruses can actually mutate the DNA, cause cancer, certain cigarettes, things can happen. Rays from the sun can change things. You've seen the Incredible Hulk and what caused that whole thing too, okay? The disease, DZ is disease, may not appear at birth, but may occur later on in life, like Parkinson's, right? So genetic abnormalities could be anything like sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, and so forth, diabetes, and things like this. And this helps out. If you know you carry the gene for this, then it's going to help out should you 
you know, if my father's got diabetes, my mother's got diabetes, I don't have diabetes, but it is going to change the way that I'm going to eat or should, right? Maybe I'll still get diabetes, but instead of it happening at 40 years old, I might get it at 55 years old, and I bought myself another 15 years because I changed the way that my diet is because I know the way my genetics are in my family. So it could educate you in that way too. All right, so now let's talk about the chromosome structure, okay? DNA, as I explained to you, could be loose, and that's why I did. You rip out all the pages in the encyclopedia set and lay it down on the floor over here. That's chromatin. And in most cases, that's what you're going to see it as. And you can't really see it because it's really thin. Chromatin is very thin, but it's scattered and you can actually see everything. When it's tightly coiled, then we're putting it back in books on the shelf. And the only time you'll want to see that is when you're ready to divide with mitosis. How it does that is kind of wraps around what we call these proteins called histones. And the histones are right here. They kind of, this is the DNA, turns into chromatin, and when it starts wrapping around these histones, it starts developing into this thing here. This is called a chromosome. And a chromosome, uh, a chromatin is DNA loosely coiled, but a chromosome is made up of two chromatids. So you're going to have a chromosome here. Okay. This is one arm of a chromosome. Then you've got a centromere here, which kind of ties something together. And then you're going to have maybe a longer arm over here. That's a chromosome. But you'll have pairs of chromosomes. There'll be another one over here, like this. Well, actually what this is, is this is a chromatid. This is a chromatid, and that makes up a chromosome. Does that make sense? All right. Most people like to draw it like this. But the only thing bad about this is because that's not one chromosome, or one, one chromatid. It's, it's really... This is a chromatid, and this is a chromatid. It's not this and that, although that's probably what you want to draw in your, in your notebook. And that's fine, as long as you understand the concept of that. Okay? Because? Over here? Right? Okay. All right. So that's what that is. So the chromatids will do that. All right? And the centromere is in the middle that kind of holds those pairs together. All right, right in here. All right, so the double helix of the DNA. All right, now let's get into this, what it kind of sh is shaped like. Um, now some of these words on here, um, refers to my chemistry lecture, but I'm going to make it, uh, I'm going to stress on that in here, all right? But you understand what these things are, what a phosphate is, what a base is, a sugar, what a nucleotide is. Basically, this is how it's made. A nucleotide is made up of three things, okay? It's made up of a, a sugar, bound together by something called a covalent bond, which is a very strong bond, and that's going to attach itself to a phosphate. Then the sugar will also be bound to something called a base. And it's a nitrogenous base. It has a nitrogen on it. Okay, that's a nucleotide. A sugar, a carbohydrate, same thing. A phosphate. In this case, this would be a base. 
one nucleotide. That's not what DNA is. DNA is a long chain of nucleotides. That's really only one, one side though, okay? That's really what RNA is. RNA is just one strand. DNA is having two strands, meaning we're gonna have another one over here. It's a ladder. And you take this ladder and twist it, that's what we call a double helix. If one side was just going to be twisted, that's a helix. One strand that's going to get twisted on its side. But we have another one over here. So we call it a double helix. Helix means twisted. It always goes sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, and we got thousands of them going all the way down. A nucleic acid is nucleotides, a chain of nucleotides. So ribonucleic acid, RNA, is a chain of nucleic acids. DNA is a chain of nucleic acids, but two chains that are tied together. Okay? The bonds over here are strong bonds. These are covalent bonds in black here. Very difficult to break them. But... We do have bonds in between bases here. These are hydrogen bonds. And when you get through my chemistry lecture, you'll learn that hydrogen bonds are very weak. We can easily break those, and we'll want to do that. The rungs here, where you're putting your feet on them, are based on bases. So the backbone is made up of sugar. The sugar we're talking about is deoxyribose. If it ends with OSC, it's a sugar or carbohydrate. If it ends with ASC, it's an enzyme. All right, sucrase, lactase. But then you have lactose and sucrose. Those are sugars or carbohydrates. The rungs are made up of one of four different bases. In DNA, we have the bases could be adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine, and they fit like a lock and key. Adenine will always go with thymine. Guanine, um, guanine will always go with cytosine. Pretty easy to know. The curve letters of C and G work together, and just think of the mnemonic ACK. That's pretty easy. Okay. In DNA, it does that. So adenine always binds with thymine, cytosine will always bind with guanine. These are bound together by hydrogen bonds. There are two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine. There are three hydrogen bonds between cytosine and guanine. The bases have different structures. Adenine and guanine are two ring structures. They have two rings, and I'll show you what they look like in a moment. 
they're known as pure reefs. Cytosine and thymine are one wing ring structures, and they're known as pyrimidines. The way I memorize it is take out your atomic guns. All right, atomic guns, A, G, atomic guns is adenine and guanine. And there's two of them, double ring, okay? And gun has a U in it. So it's gonna be the purine, not the pyrimidine. Ooh, it took me a while to figure out that part, okay? so. It looks very busy on here, but that's why I want to keep on showing you that come up with mnemonics. As you come up with your own mnemonic, you're studying this material because you're trying to see how am I going to fit this in. All right, I got to know like purines going in, purines. How am I going to get purines going into adenine and guanine? As you're saying to yourself, you're studying and you don't realize it. Okay. So again, it's just showing you over here. This is one side, and here's kind of like what I drew over over there. And uh, you can see that A goes with T, G goes with C. And you got this twisting going on. This one's nice over here. You can see the nucleotide here, but it's a long chain of nucleotides. You can also see here that cytosine goes with guanine. You can also appreciate that guanine is two rings, cytosine is one ring. Adenine is two rings, thymine is one ring. Going from adenine and thymine, there's two hydrogen bonds there. And guanine guanine and cytosine, there's three hydrogen bonds there. That's a purine, guanine, that's a pyrimidine, cytosine. Okay, a lot there, it's just a lot of memorization, structure-wise. Okay? RNA, one nucleotide chain. When you see two here, it's DNA. But RNA is just, you know, it has a nucleotide, but it's a long chain of nucleotides as much as you saw this. But there's a few differences between RNA and DNA. One, obviously, is that, like I said, one, one chain as opposed to two chains. RNA is one chain. The nucleotide in RNA does have, that's what makes it a nucleotide, it does have a sugar or carbohydrate, a phosphate, and a base. But the sugar is different. Instead of sugar, in, like in DNA, it's deoxyribose. This one is ribose. Deoxyribose is taking ribose and taking away one of its oxygens. That's why it's called deoxyribose. But in ribose, it has its extra oxygen. The other difference is there is no thiamine in RNA. Instead, it's replaced with uracil. So this means that uracil is going to buy with adenine when we deal with RNA. There is no thiamine in here. And uracil is a pyrimidine also, a one ring structure. So these are what they kind of look like. Be sure you know how to draw these. They may be asked on an exam. Not on my exams, but in the future. Thank God, right? So I'm not going to ask you about that. Joke. I'm not going to answer you about how this structure is. If you like biochemistry, you like this, you'll learn how this is. But it's just showing you here's two rings. So adenine and guanine are two rings, whereas cytosine, thiamine, and uracil are all one ring structures. So besides knowing the, the, the one ring or two rings, that's all I want you to know in the structure wise. There's three types of RNA there's messenger RNA. A messenger RNA, known as mRNA, is a mirror image of a gene. We'll talk about this when we get to transcription. It's going to make a mirror image of something from DNA. And it's going to go from the nucleus, where the DNA is, and made a copy of it, and it's going to go outside in the cytoplasm, and it's going to find a ribosome and start making uh, a protein with the help of transfer RNA tRNA or transfer RNA is going to have an amino acid attached to it and bring it onto the 
messenger RNA where it is at the ribosome. And it's going to make a long chain. With this amino acid, another tRNA is going to come there, another tRNA, and it's going to make the amino acids bind to each other just the way a Lego set would be putting more Legos on there making this really long. You also have ribosomal RNA that's created by the nucleolus, and this is what's going to make the ribosomes, those two subunits to make a ribosome, making that clam. That's what's going to happen with that.